You're listening to Online Pet Health Podcasts with Dr. Megan Kelly, continuing education for veterinarian rehabilitation therapists. Learn more at OnlinePetHealth.com. Hey, Vet Rehabbers. It's one of my Behind the Vet Rehab Practice podcasts this week. These are one of my favorite interviews to do. And what I love about them is we get to interview Vet Rehabbers and they share with us their wins and their losses. And although it's not great, they made the mistakes. But when they share them with us, we get to learn from them. So when we find ourselves in that same position, we have hindsight, which we would never have had before. So you get to fast track your success by not repeating the same mistakes that they made. So now this is my second interview with Lisa Mason from Florida Veterinary Rehabilitation. Since my first chat with Lisa in episode 72, Lisa has become a partner in VROMP and it stands for Veterinary Rehabilitation and Orthopedic Medicine Partners. She discusses the positive changes and impact that this partnership has had for her, her team and her practice. Before we head over to that chat, a quick shout out to Sam Maynard. Thank you for your message and post on LinkedIn, Sam. This is what Sam had to say. I came across your amazing podcast a year or so ago and have been absolutely loving them. I listen on my hour journey to work and I'm always caught up to date now. I feel truly inspired by all the fabulous content and would like to say a huge thank you to you and your team. Thank you so much, Sam. I'd love to gift you an limited edition Vet Me Rehabilitation mug. Please email me on meg at onlinepetalf.com. And before we head over to the interview, a quick word also from our sponsors. Thank you to Paul Prosper for making these podcasts free and available to everyone. At Paul Prosper, we believe true pet well-being demands a three-pronged approach, prevention, support, and rehabilitation. Our brands are trusted by veterinarians, universities, and rehab facilities alike. Whether you are looking to train, rehabilitate, or help your pet age gracefully, our brands like the Help of My Partners, Fit Paws, Muffins Halo, and Response System offer effective, innovative, and proven Proven solutions. Learn more about how Paul Prosper can help your pet age gracefully today at paulprosper.com. All right, let's hear what Lisa has to say. Hey, Lisa, thank you so much for joining Hi. me. Hi, thanks for having me. <laughs> awesome to have you on the podcast again. Um, I had a quick look to see when it was that we last chatted, and it feels like I must say just the other day ago, but it wasn't. It was the third of December, two thousand and nineteen. A Can you believe this happened? <laughs> That's a lot yeah, of years. Lot. It was like literally just before COVID, right? It was, um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so it was episode 72. So we're on like 255 or 269. I don't even know what the number is. So yeah, great to have you back on. A lot has changed at your practice. For those listeners that haven't listened to your first podcast, won't you tell them about your practice, so where, where you started off and what's happened now. And obviously that's why we had today to chat about all the changes. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. First of all, um, I love online pet health and, you know, started listening a lot of years ago and it's really helped support me and my confidence in where I'm at right now. But yeah, so I am a uh, standalone rehab facility in central Florida, Florida veterinary rehabilitation. And I'm certified in rehab, acupuncture, pain management. I've got a crew of, of people helping me out and uh, started out as a small team of uh, five uh, in 2018 when I pulled my practice out of a general practice and uh, grew very quickly. So that was 2018. And then we've grown and you know, successfully made it through the COVID years and um, grew actually, I, I feel like faster during that time. Um, I think a lot of people felt like that too. And uh, as we were going through that, I developed a relationship with VROMP or Veterinary Rehabilitation Orthopedic Medicine Partners, which is led by Juliet Tomlinson, as well as some amazing financial business folks. And uh, we created the country's first standalone rehabilitation partnership. And I joined in 2021. And so I've been with them for two years now. And it's been a very exciting process. We are now just finishing, um, well, in October, we moved into our brand new 
beautiful 3,600 square foot facility and onboarded two new associate rehabilitation veterinarians with our practice and have just continued to grow. And we're up to, I think, 15 employees now, uh, which is <laughs> quite dramatic and have just it just very much so enjoyed the large amounts of patients we're able to treat and be able to, you know, care for uh, the Central Florida region uh, dogs that need help with mobility. So it's been a really great process. Wow. So yeah, you guys are super, super busy now. You know, I can't believe, I, I can't wait to come and visit the facility. And <laughs> yeah, it's great that you've got a bigger team now too. So let's chat about VROMP um, because, you know, I think that, you know, when you think about sort of um, coming into like a, because it sounds a little bit like a corporate kind of buyout, you know, mm -hmm. there's always in the veterinary world, quite a negative connotation to that. People always think right. like, you know, they're going to get bought out by this corporate. And so it's very different to that VROMP. It's not like a big corporate that's going to come in and buy your practice and you have, you're just working for them. So can you just, for the listeners, tell us about VROMP, how it actually works um, and how, you know, how it actually happened that you um, sort of started working with them? What was the thought process from your side that made mm -hmm. you think, I need to find uh, somebody to help me. Uh, so basically VRUMP is a partnership of different veterinarians coming together that are still wanting to be within their practice and to be able to grow their practice, especially, you know, with doing cutting edge rehabilitation medicine. So we're creating a playbook for how, the right way to run a rehabilitation clinic or center. They can be very difficult to get profits from rehabilitation and to know how to run the business correctly because the model is so different than general practice. And what we've kind of decided to do, and I actually started talking with the founders of VROMP back in 2019, I was actually talking and discussing and, and figuring out what was going on with the, this potential group. And, and it, it sounded like we were trying to figure out how you're able to put a budget together, how you're able to create a, a functioning human resource group, you know, to understand how to be an employer of choice. And so when you join the group or what we're looking for, I should say, is again, somebody who wants to stay with their practice, usually a multi-doctor rehabilitation standalone practice. And, and you go through a couple of, you know, lots of lots of financial, you know, review and looking over if your medicine is appropriate. And if you've got the right mentality for, you know, joining a partnership and working with each other, we often get together and have group meetings where we get to talk about all of the challenges that come along with running a rehab center from human resources to marketing, to all of the things that, you know, you cover a lot on online pet health. We have a team of people that we sit down with and we talk about it and we basically have these amazing brainstorm sessions and are able to go forth with, you know, action plans on how we can implement those within our own practices. Um, right now we are four practices. Uh, we just opened our fourth practice in Atlanta, which is where I'm at today. And we are very excited about the, the, the growth of the practice or of the partnership, I should say. So essentially when, when you join it, like you said, it's not, it's not a corporate practice. You know, when you join, you, you basically are getting a shareholding of the entire group and it's uh you know, for the long term, you're not getting, you know, immediate financial benefits and things, but you're for the long term, you're looking at, this is how I'm going to be able to grow my practice, you know, three, four or five fold from what you could, if you just stayed by yourself. Um, there's also the, the group investment in your practice. So helping to grow your own practice, you know, whether it be a second facility or for myself, it was getting into a larger, more appropriate facility and also, you know, uh, hiring new doctors, which takes a big investment 
to be able to, you know, afford that and, and you put the money up forth to try and just be able to grow. So those were some of the big things in the beginning that I immediately needed. I knew how fast I was growing and I was drowning in patients as a lot of people are feeling, I'm sure. Um, and I couldn't keep up with doing the business plus, you know, seeing so many patients and trying to also stay up on my education and all those things at the same time. It was, it was a lot. And, uh, now I, I mean, I have different challenges now, but it's, uh, it doesn't feel like I'm drowning anymore. So. Yeah. It's such an interesting business model. So, I mean, it's very different to a corporate where the corporate comes and buys the practice, right? Outright. And so it's very rare that, um, you would you would have a share. So sometimes a corporate can come into a veterinary practice and they will buy a share of the practice. And then if you're the business owner, you still own a percentage of that. Mm-hmm. Um, but most of the time they want to buy it outright. Whereas here, from what it sounds like, is that you are a partner in the whole group. Mm-hmm. And I love that because that means you have a vested interest in all the other branches. So mm-hmm. when you sit down and you're brainstorming, it's, you know, for you, you want the other branches to succeed as much as you want your own. And, yeah. and so it's a very different model and not one that I've seen before in veterinary. I, I don't know if you've seen something like this. No, I haven't. Yeah. And from what I've heard from my friends that have joined corporate practices, they're not as happy. So they don't have any autonomy. They don't have the ability to make those decisions on the floor. They don't, and and it's, it can be very frustrating for them. I have one friend who she just, it it just was too much for her. And she ended up retiring earlier than she thought. And it, because she was no longer her practice, you know, and that, I think that's sad to me. You know, I think my, my dad actually is a, a human surgeon and his practice was sold to the corporate, uh, that brought, bought out the hospital. And the minute, the day he retired, like his name was ripped from the wall and from, and I was like, it's like, you're losing your child or something, <laughs> you know? So I still feel like this is, this is my baby and I want all of our practices to succeed. I have a vested interest in all of them. I love the collaboration. I just think collaboration is so much nicer than having to be on an island by yourself. It's, yeah. it's just, you know, because it, it was getting very lonely being a singular practitioner, you know, and I didn't know what the right choice was to make. Do I buy this piece of equipment? How do I run an ROI? How do I, you know, and I knew some of these things. I mean, you know, we've worked through business basics and stuff with, together and did some, you know, lectures and things on that, but it was just different having somebody else to run those things by and somebody that could guide me. And that, you know, we talk about like, you know, what laser are you using? What laser are you using? Which one do you like? You know, what about your PRP machine? How about joint injections? What are you using? And that's really cool. It's been fun because our new practice partner, uh, Kara McNamara, she is here in Atlanta and she's been, it was fun. I got to chat with her to uh, yesterday and we were just talking about how we do things differently and what we do. And, you know, it's like, there's not one right answer. They're all like all these different answers that are right. And you get to like collaborate and talk about it. And um, I love it. I just, I think that that's the part that I missed more than anything. It's sort of like being in, in a mastermind, right? Because like, I think about like when you're on your own, like, as you said, you know, here you are, you're seeing all these patients and, um, you know, vet rehab practice, we spend a lot more time consulting than we did in veterinary practice, you know? And so we're in the consult room all the time. We like juggling all the balls, got different hats on. You're like running the business, you're doing the HR, like you say, keep me up to date with your learning. So then when you have to make a decision, like what laser you're going to buy, or is this actually a good investment? Sometimes, you know, you don't think about all the things that you need to consider. And it's wonderful to be able to bounce something off somebody else who's been through the same thing. And then they might say, well, have you thought about this? 
and you haven't because you just really haven't had the capacity to right. sit down and really think about it. So yeah, I love it. Yeah. So like if you can say like, you know, what has changed now for you? So um, yeah. besides obviously not feeling alone, um, what has changed for you in your day-to-day in what you're doing and how you're feeling at work? Uh, so the first one is probably, I was encouraged to stop working as much because I was not having time to do the sit down and the think about what's my budget, what are we doing? Like, what are we buying the time to do meetings, the time to guide my other associate vets. And that was really important and very hard for me. Um, I'm kind of a workhorse. And so for somebody to say, slow down, um, was a big piece of it because I just, I don't think I would have done it on my own. I was trying to do it. You know, I was just trying to do everything I possibly could. So that was a big part of it. And so my day-to-day, so I actually have an entire like afternoon where I just focus on meetings. The other part is, is that my practice manager has, um, more guidance from other practice managers, as well as from like our CFO, her name's Jenny, um, which I think she's been on the podcast before, but, um, and Jenny is able to help guide my practice manager where I may not have the time to be step-by-step with her and give her all of kind of my thoughts and how to do certain things, which is great because I think managing a rehab practice is not something that anybody is one person knows how to do perfectly. So that's been um, a really, that's, that's been actually very helpful. I don't have to do as much meetings with her necessarily because she can do meetings with other people. She has um, a really nice relationship with all of the practice managers and they have their own little group chats and things like that. And their little meetings that they do, which is fun. There are some pieces of it that I'm like, I don't have time to work on the website. So within our group, I'm like, I can just say, Hey, can somebody do, you know, X, Y, and Z with the website and help us out to get this going. And somebody does. So it's taken off of my plate. Um, It still goes back through me and, you know, I still edit and do things like that, but the things that I don't necessarily have to be directly involved with, I can pass it on to someone else who's very knowledgeable. I feel like I've been able to focus whenever I'm actually at work. I've been able to focus on my patients more versus going, oh crap, did I pay the electric bill or did I like, did I do this? Or, you know, am I worried about the parking lot or am I worried about, you know, something else going on with the business or worried about, oh, so such and such showed up late for work today. And like, I know that we have to have a conversation with her and we need to do blah, blah, blah. So I don't have to think about those pieces, the HR stuff. I, you know, I can pass that on. So my day-to-day is still, it's just more rehab focused when I'm doing rehab. And then when I'm not doing rehab and I'm doing my businesses, I get to have really nice meetings. And then the other thing I would say is that we've been able to create some really awesome calculators. Um, So we call it the caseload calculator. And so we can actually look at that and get a temperature on if we're pushing the staff too hard, or if we need to hire more staff um, based on our caseload generation that we're doing. And the fact that somebody's really smart brain was able to create an Excel file that can do all of that for us, like that's pretty awesome. So you're like taking the minds of people who are business minded, maybe not rehab minded, but business minded that can take these things that we wanted to develop so that we have an idea of how the business is running and be able to create really cool files. So then I just jump into a business meeting and they're like, here's the data. Here's everything that's there. This is what you need to see. And I'm like, fantastic. I didn't have to do all that. So I just spend less time doing that, but I still have the numbers presented for me so that I can see them. I mean, I I remember every day I would close the books. I would look at the number and I would have some number in my head of what I needed to hit for target to be able to pay the bills And it was nothing I had written down on a piece of paper. It was just like, I think this looks right, but I'm not really sure. And, you know, fortunately it it was right most of the time, but as you get bigger and you have more people, you're like, I don't know. I mean, am I carrying enough product? Am I, you know, being able to service enough clients? Can I take vacation? You know, like these are things that I used to ask myself all the time. 
can I take vacation without like, and be still be able to pay my, my staff? And the answer now is like, yes, I can, I can go to conferences, I can go on vacation and, and we've got it. Everything is budgeted out so that we know exactly what's going on. And we spend a lot of time on budgets and what that looks like. And then how do we ana- uh, do an analysis for new piece of equipment? And it's just that piece of it is very nice to be able to not have to do that again on an island by yourself thinking, am I doing the right choice or am I going to sink us? Um, so I, I love that piece of everything that happens within BROM. Yeah, so it sounds like you're feeling like really safe and secure in running your business. You know, you've got somebody else or other people to back you up in the decisions that you're making. And that gives you a lot of peace. It does. I would say that's a great way to put it. The piece of it is, you know, and two, it's like, okay, well, if I have a bad month, like last year, we got hit by two hurricanes back to back and I had to close my business for like a total of like two weeks. Like that's hard. Uh, but I, I didn't worry at the time because I was like, well, I mean, we have like the full amount of profits from all the companies. If I need a little cushion or support, it's going to be a give and take, you know, no, not one yeah. practice is carrying everybody else. We're all kind of helping each other when that kind of happens, you know? So I don't feel the same stress. Like I, I don't lose sleep over the fact that I'm not going to be able to pay the bills. And that's, yeah. that's, it's quite a nice feeling to have, but I know a lot of people out there probably are stressed out about certain financial things and maybe are not speaking about it or talking about it with, you know, they don't tell their staff about it. They don't tell a lot of people about it, but they might be sitting there worried about certain financial things. I mean, that's the challenge of a business owner, right? I mean, you know, and I think about other businesses and this is where veterinary is so different and vet rehab is so different. You know, when you think about other businesses, right? Let's say somebody is a baker and they start this bakery business. They start off with them and, and there's that guy, Michael Gerber, he calls you um, like all the technicians, right? So you, you start off and you create, you start baking. Um, then what eventually happens is you get other people to bake for you. And then you step back and you, you run the business, you know? Mm-hmm. And so you might've started off, but then the other people, same with plumbers or whatever, you know, it's very rare that that person carries on being the technician. Right. But it's not like that with veterinary because that's why we studied is to and, and most people that own practices, they don't want to be the business owner. They want right. to be the veterinarian or the vet right. rehab therapist, right? That's why they did it. And that's where right. they that's what they love to do every day. Yeah. And so I think all of us are just in these practices, not everyone, um, but a lot of people are in these practices owning their own businesses not really wanting to run the business, just wanting to, to be a vet rehab therapist. Yeah. And so it's really difficult because you are doing, you actually are running, you're doing two jobs. You yes. know, it's a lot easier when you step back and you're just running the business, right? You've got that yeah. time and space to be able to do, make all these decisions. Now suddenly, you know, you've got the two. And, and the problem is, is that, you know, they're not enough, job positions for people just to say, I'm going to be like, I just want to be employed. There aren't those jobs. And so people come out of whatever study they've done and they're like, this is where I live. And there are no other vet rehab therapists there. Like I'm just going to have to start my own business. And they just, they just do it because this is what I want to do. And they get thrown into it. And all those stresses, you're right. I think that they're often not speaking about it. Right. If they've got staff, they just shoulder it. And and I remember back when I had my practice, I mean, the, I, I used to just, I, I had my break even points and I can remember just wanting to get to that day and I'd be adding up and adding up every single day. And then it's like 25th of the month, 26th of the month, 27th of the month, 28th of the month. And then the stress starts to get higher and higher. And you're thinking like, are we actually going to make it this month? You know, yeah. like, and you look at your the diary and it's not booked enough and you're thinking, oh my gosh. And then like on the 30th, you like mm-hmm. break even, you know, and it wasn't mm-hmm. always like that. I mean, there were days where we were break even on the 21st and we had a good month, mm-hmm. but those stresses um, are hard are really hard. Mm-hmm. And it's nice to know that you've got someone else to carry you 
-hmm. but also knowing that your practice has contributed up until that time to all that profit, right? So it's not like you're just being carried by everyone else. You have to be a contributor. You have to, Mm -hmm. your practice has to be profitable. And because of the way that they're running the whole group, Mm -hmm. they all are, you know? So that's, yeah, yeah, that's really great. And I must say for me, the HR side of things, um, Mm -hmm. having some help with that, because that's also a huge challenge, something that we, we, we're not taught anything about, about, and we want, (laughs) you know, we want happy, happy staff, you know, and I do think that vet rehab, just because, and, and maybe this is from veterinary, you know, um, I was I was having a conversation the other day. I think it was in the 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 coffee, the online coffee, and we we're talking about, you know, how this mentality of working as a veterinarian, mm-hmm. like you don't get breaks, and you know you don't get overtime, and well, I never did, you know, and you just you go to work and you just work flat out, and you're lucky if you can go to the toilet so and have lunch, and then you start consulting again, and it's normal. It's like this is how it is, you know, so you mm-hmm. come into veterinary and you're just like, this is, this is veterinary. This is how it is. And that's sort of been extrapolated now into vet rehab, mm-hmm. but it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable working yeah. like that. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it leads eventually to burnout. And if yes. we, we need to have a culture in which, you know, that's not a normal thing to work like that. Um, we need breaks. We need days in which we've got space to be able to learn space to write our notes we shouldn't be having to go home at night and till 10 o'clock at night be writing notes that's not life we we can't live like that you know and so it's it's great that you have that support Mm -hmm. and calculator sounds amazing to be able Mm -hmm. to work out like Mm -hmm. are we like overloading our team because we just do you know if like if if the animals that need to be treated, we just yeah. treat them, you right. know. And right. I think that only when somebody crashes do we mm-hmm. think, oh, maybe we're working too hard. Yeah, and uh, you know those those are really great points because I, I was just uh, doing a, a podcast with uh, Joe Lemon yesterday, and we started talking about burnout and how it's a huge topic that we're talking about right now. Not only you know, within the staff, but like you said, the veterinarian, and it's really hard for a veterinarian to say, I love treating all these animals, but I need to, I need to take a break. I need to be able to have certain hours where I can shut it off and say, I'm not available to you and not feel guilty about it. And I think it's extra hard in veterinary medicine because we're so passionate about helping animals. And, and that's where, if we can create a culture where we're respectful and we create respectful boundaries, then we can proceed on with this career for a lifelong. And I found I, to me, that is probably one of the hardest things for me. It's just creating healthy boundaries. And, Mm -hmm. you know, for me, I think part of it is, is hiring new veterinarians to be able to say, it's okay for me to take a Saturday off and to not be available because I have another vet that's on staff that is perfectly capable of handling any questions that come up for my clients. Um, It's perfectly fine for me to take a vacation and not to answer emails while I'm sitting on the beach. It's okay. Um, (laughs) So that is, you know, that's a huge piece that some times people just need to hear that it's okay for you to take a break. And, um, because if you don't, like you said, you're going to burn out and you're just going to wear yourself ragged. And interestingly enough, whenever I hired my associate vets, it, we calculated, like, we didn't say you're going to have work 40 clinical hours, and then you're going to have to do all your notes on the outside. I actually calculated note time within their 40 hours of work. And it was like, if I'm able to do this, And to be able to calculate it and they're able to do the best job while the hours that they're working, then we shouldn't have to worry about what the end result is going to be with profits and things like that. So you don't have to work and kill yourself to make the profit. And that, you know, kind of brings it back to what is the rehab business model that works? 
And part of it is, is because you, if you yourself are working yourself to death, you're probably not making your profit. You have to have people that are, that can do the jobs that you don't have to do. And that can be replicated, whether it be that you hire a certified rehab tech, or you've got an assistant that can help take notes, you know, and be your scribe. You know, we've talked about that quite a bit whenever we've chatted before. Um, or is it that you have, you know, somebody that is able to run the laser and do massage and are certified massage therapist, you know? So it's finding people that are not necessarily a doctor to be able to cover those things and, and to be able to free you up to do the evals and to be able to do the exams so that you're not constantly doing all those things. It's actually more profitable to hire people. You know, it's a challenge, but it's still more profitable. And so trying to then create this environment to be the employer of choice, to be able to hire people that, and then keep them happy without then allowing them to get overwhelmed is also the next piece of it. So then that's where the caseload estimator and, and calculator comes into to play is to say, how do we continue to do this? Well, clearly we need more help. So we're going to hire another person, you know, so we just keep going and going until we say that everybody is going to be at a homeostasis where they're not overworking, but they're not also standing around doing nothing. So, you know, you have to figure out the balance within your own practice so that everyone is balanced, not just the veterinarian, not just the techs. So. Let's go back to something you said. You said sometimes it's more profitable to actually hire somebody yep. than it is to do it yourself. And I think that that is one thing where a lot of vet rehabbers really struggle. Yep. So I think that they stay for way too long, just them and maybe an admin person. Or And to make that shift to employing somebody or getting another team member that can help with the rehab side of things, they're so nervous that they're not going to be able to afford them. Yep. And um, I, I remember being in exactly the same position, yeah. but not once when I hired another person that could help me with rehab, was it ever a bad decision? It always, yeah. we always made more money in the end and yeah. freed myself up. Like you say, like mm -hmm. I actually enjoyed my work more mm -hmm. because I was doing the things that I enjoyed doing right. and, and not having to do things that probably are not, were not my skill set or not things that I, maybe I was maybe overqualified to do, but something that somebody else actually was far better than I was. Right. Um, right. And well, I, I think it's, there's a couple of things that come into that, that make people nervous about hiring somebody. And I, I think there's the financial piece of it, but I think the other part is, is not knowing how to teach someone how to do it the way that you would do it or being okay with them doing it their way. And, and I, I've seen that a lot where it's like, I don't know how to teach so-and-so how to do treadmill the way that I would do treadmill or to do therapeutic exercise the way I would do therapeutic exercise. And part of it is, is there isn't one right way to do it, but the other way is, is, you know, you can, you can do hands-on training. You can do, um, there's amazing certif uh, certification programs out there right now that teach a lot of those things. There's online classes and stuff, you know, so there's so many ways to be able to teach someone to do those skills. And I think it's worth the, the investment in someone you find the right person that can do those things and you invest in them by doing the cert, uh, certification programs or by doing online training, whatever it is that they need to be in that, the right place. And, um, and it, it it's very rewarding. You know, we've sent at this point through our clinic, we've sent two people through uh, the certification program at CRI. And, um, and I, I think it's there, they've greatly benefited and it was, you know, it's an investment on the group, but I still think that they've, they've really benefited from that knowledge. Um, somebody else walking them through it in a different way than maybe how we were walking them through it. And, and, so I do find a lot of benefit to those programs so that they can learn how to do things in a different way. And honestly, like, I mean, I used to think I was pretty good in the underwater treadmill. I haven't been in the treadmill and I can't even tell you how long I would probably suck at it these days. I probably wouldn't. I'd be like, which button do I push? <laughs> so there's definitely better people out there who, and I don't even know if I would say I was overqualified for the treadmill. I would say that right now I'm probably underqualified for treadmill, but, uh, 
you know, I, it's, it's one of those things that I think there are people out there who do great jobs with some of these, these different, uh, you know, job performance areas that they can, they can really bring, they can become stellar and, and really shine and clients love them. So. Yeah, no, no, I mean, definitely underwater treadmill. It was, I mean, I used to do it, but it was, and, and, and I used to, I actually enjoyed it when, you know, one of the team members was off and I had to get in there and do it, mm-hmm. but gee, it's hard work. Physics it hard. It is yeah, physically, it yeah. is exhausting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, and, and to kind of like tag onto that, just one of my favorite compliments from my clients is you have a great team. I don't want to hear Dr. Mason, you're great. I don't want to hear yeah. that. What I want to hear is you have a great team. And that just makes me so happy because it's like that team is what's helping your dog or your cat to move better and to be more mobile. It's not me. Yeah. It's not anything that I'm doing. So, yeah. you know, and that's that's the part that I love. I think it's it's such a team approach to it. Uh, and the patients love, I mean, they all have their favorites, you know, they are come running in and they're so excited to see all the team members. So I, I just, I just think that that's the part of rehab that, yeah, it brings challenges like any HR, you know, department will, you know, <laughs> loves having new uh, employees join in and having to like go through all the paperwork and all the problems that come with another person. But it's, to me, it's, it's way more beneficial to hire those people to help you out. Yeah. And I mean, I think that whenever you add a new person, there's always a shift and a change and things that you used to do used to work so well. And then suddenly they don't because there's another person in the mix and Mm -hmm. communication and things. And we've just got somebody now um, who's joined on on Petalt and is helping with the marketing. And it's like so many things we are like, oh, we need to update that system because Mm -hmm. now there's another person. And Mm -hmm. now, you know, I'm not communicating with this person, somebody else's. And, and it's always like that. Um, But once you find your groove and you get it, then it's great because you just have another person to brainstorm with. And Mm -hmm. yeah, I love that you've got a great team because that's what it's all about. You know, it's that unity working together. And like you say, it's not one person Mm -hmm. who's helping. It's everyone together. So that's Mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Let's chat a bit about the marketing of the practice. Mm-hmm. Um, so how does that work? I mean, like, is that, is that very different to, to like how you, how you've been marketing before and what are your referrals like now that you are part of B-Romp? Is, is there a change in that or is everything pretty much the same? I'll tell you all of that is the same. I don't, I would tell you that most of my referral clinics have no idea what VROMP is or even that we're part of it. It's not part of our branding or anything that we do. Uh, branding's essentially the exact same. What we've, we actually haven't done a lot of marketing up until this point. The biggest reason is because I didn't have room for it. I was, you know, before I hired on my new doctors, I was booked out for six to eight weeks for new, new clients. And, um, that was very, very, very hard for me to, to swallow. I don't like it when people can't get help straight away. And, uh, so we didn't market at the, the very beginning and I kind of even slowed down on my referral, uh, letters. So my primary marketing scheme, and, and I've talked about this before, not only pet health is, is referring vets and reaching out to referring vets and being able to make those touch points with them. So starting this year, we are, you know, really hit the marketing towards our referring vets a little bit harder and, and just the form of, of letter communication and, um, you know, letting them know, Hey, we're here. We've got new docs. We've got, you know, new facility. We're going to do a fun little meet and greet just for all the referring vets in the the community to come out in April. Uh, we're going to do that. We're going to do like a wine and charcuterie night and, uh, got it sponsored by some, some companies. And, um, nice. I think that's going to be, I think that's going to be super fun. Um, I've, I've really always tried to, you know, the marketing right now, we've just we've barely done anything. And we're actually having a think tank, uh, tomorrow on marketing within the group and what we want to kind of decide to do. So, you know, to be continued on what we decide, you know, as far as that goes, marketing, in veterinary medicine right now is I think a lot of people use the companies that are out there that are, they kind of do standard uh, stock footage and things like that for, for veterinary practices. You just can't do that with rehab. There's not really stock images for rehab 
So we're kind of diving into that to see if there's something that we can potentially do to help with rehab marketing, um, you know, on a whole and kind of, you know, maybe visiting that playbook uh, for rehab. So, you know, again, like that's like a big thing of the, the VROMP community is that we're trying to write a playbook for other rehab practices to kind of reach to and see and, you know, how we can kind of help out with that. Um, so to be continued on that and figure out what we decide to, to do, you know, I, I definitely think some cool video footage is, you know, some professional video footage is in the future. You know, we've really sat down and kind of put some early thoughts to that, you know, cause I think you can use, you can probably create some good stock footage in a treadmill, uh, with dogs walking in treadmills or doing therapeutic exercise. I don't think you need to make it very personalized, um, for each clinic. So yeah, yeah, there's some things that are kind of tossed around a little bit there, but yeah, so far, like we just like, we hit social media, you know, pretty hard with our following of folks and, um, for marketing. I, I, I just love, I think I, I love putting all the stories up and then people tagging us within, you know, their own pets stories of mobility and, uh, you know, just creating a nice community of people on social media. Um, I think that's the, a great way to do some marketing among the community and then word of mouth, of course, is always, <laughs> that's always the best referral source to me. Yeah. So obviously now, I mean, there's been a lot of growth in the practice what would you say your biggest challenge at the moment is so i think my biggest challenge right now is the the team culture and making sure that everyone's needs are covered historically i was in one room with all of everybody and i knew when somebody was having problems um now I don't. I am on my side of the building. Therapy is on the other side of the building. I might be stuck in procedures room. I might be like not in touch with the whole team. And so figuring out what the dynamic of certain interactions, certain relationships, and, and where I need to step in, where I need to be involved, where I need to add more communication, more meetings, that's, that's a, the hardest part, I think for me. And then figuring out, like, I've got, you know, different, re- I've got different associate vets within the clinic. Not everybody's reporting to me. I don't know about every single case in the building anymore. So it's, it's a very, like, it, we used to be right on top of each other. And now like, there's no yelling across the building to like, say, Hey, can you come and see this dog? Like, it's like, we've got radios now and we've got, you know, we're a little more sophisticated with rather than yelling. So that's, I think the hard part, you know, t- the team culture yeah. and communication and, and figuring out the right speed and rate that people need the touch points with us, you know? yeah so when you get bigger and it's so I mean I can remember when it was like me and then me and one person oh, it was super mm-hmm. easy and then me and two people and a little bit more tricky but still fine and yeah. me and four people and then I, I think at one stage it was me and eight people you know at my mm-hmm. practice and then it, uh, you know I hear you it's like because you don't get to see people and you don't it's that communication it's just finding a balance and finding a way in which we can communicate and I mean, we have those challenges every day at Online Pet Health, mainly because we're not together, right? Um, so, I mean, we're online, all yeah. of us in different places. So it's just Shane and me who are in the same office normally. But otherwise, I mean, Michelle is in the UK. Anae is another part of South Africa. Nadia is another part of South Africa. Yeah. So is the web person. So, I mean, we have communication challenges. Maybe that's actually a podcast that we could do because... You know, we have, you know, trying to maintain communication. Um, yeah. But we used to have, I tell you in my practice, we used to have a board. Mm. And, um, you know, anything that happened that anyone else needed to know about a particular case, we would always write it on the board or any messages. And so every time you walked into the office, you know, you would look at the board and just see, is there anything that I need to know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, that was one way in which we yeah. used to do it in my practice. Yeah, um, but I think up- WhatsApp groups also, I mean, we didn't have WhatsApp back in my day when yeah. I had my practice, but I think WhatsApp groups are a good way to communicate, right? 
Um, yeah. So, so we use Teams, Microsoft Teams. And yeah. so we're all connected on there. And so it, that basically is like our whiteboard, you know? So we yeah. throw up messages on there um, on Teams. And that at first was a little overwhelming because I felt like my phone was ringing off the hook whenever somebody would write something. I figured out how to shut that stuff down, but I was, I'm still able to go to it and read it if I need to, but, um, it, uh, it's a nice forum to be able to, you know, be, everybody's got it open on their computers at work, um, or on their phones or whatever. So the, the teams app has been nice for inner communication, um, inner office communication, you know, it's still, it's hard because like, I think written word is always harder to communicate if, uh, you know, you don't really know how people are feeling. And some people like, like, I'm kind of like, just, Hey, just pop in my room. If you've got a problem, like just swing by, pop in my room, like no big deal. Like when people are like, am I bothering you? And I'm like, no, just come in and tell me what's going on. Whereas other people might be like, please leave, please, please don't interrupt me five times. Like yeah. it's, I just like, kind of, I like that. Like I, I miss people popping in and saying hi all the time. So, you know, yeah. it's just trying to figure that out and trying to keep the team together. And, you know, I, I always heard people talking about how they had like reception versus back office and they would kind of squibble squabble between the two. I never experienced that because reception was like in the middle of what we were doing. So we never had miscommunication. And now like, there's some that people are like, why did they schedule it like that? I don't know why that, that was scheduled. And I'm like, okay, you guys need to talk to you guys. And like, we just need to bring you guys together and like not have this big, like blaming system. And, you know, so you start getting the feel of a normal veterinary clinic, uh, when you start getting bigger and establishing different departments, it can be more challenging. So, yeah. Lisa, it's been so amazing chatting to you and I'm so excited to listen. I think we'll definitely have to have an update maybe in a year or so to see where you're at. And thanks for sharing everything that's happening in the practice and good luck with VROMP. And um, yeah, looking forward to hearing all of the new clinics that are going to be opening and um, yeah, good luck with everything. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me again. Awesome, Lisa. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab. A big thanks to our sponsor, Paul Prosper. Their sponsorship allows us to be able to give this podcast to you for free. Please go and check them out. You can go to paulprosper.com. Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit. It's on Friday the 10th and Saturday the 11th of November. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference. It's created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members, you get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information and continued education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.